Good morning. It's a great day to talk about the graph of a function. So I have this function drawn for you. It is called g of x, and we know it's a function because it passes the vertical line test. So we're going to talk about some aspects of this function that we're going to need to apply to other functions. First of all, let's talk about the domain. The domain is the x values for which a function is defined. So we've talked about domain in the past and how to find it um, algebraically. If we have a square root function, then uh, we want to set the radicand greater than or equal to zero. If we have variables in the denominator, we set the denominator not equal to zero. But here we don't have any kind of equation. We just have a picture. So to find its domain, we are going to scan this graph since it's the x values. So it's all these x values down here. Scan the graph from left to right, and we're going to use interval notation. So if we look at this kind of like it's a number line down on the x-axis, where would we start our number line? We'd start it right here. And since it's a closed circle, we would want to use a bracket at this value. So that guy is negative 2. And then we're going to keep shading our number line as long as this function is going. And the last thing we come across is this arrow here on g of x. And so our second number in interval notation will be infinity. So the domain for this function would be a bracket negative 2 to infinity. Now remember, infinity always has a parenthesis. So for domain, we want to use interval notation and that is with x values because it's domain, so the x values. And when you have a graph, you're going to scan the graph left to right. Okay. Range is going to be the y values defined by the function. So here we have the y values. And so the, uh, the range is kind of like scanning the graph um, up and down instead of left and right like the domain was. So if you think about you know, the negative end of your y axis is in the, at the bottom, the positive end is at the top. If you think about kind of turning your graph this direction and then scanning it like we did for domain left to right, then what we're really doing is scanning that graph from bottom to top. So we'd want to look at this y-axis and say, okay, along this number line here, what's the first y value that we come across with this function? And it's going to be this one right here. And that looks to be y equals 2. And then we keep scanning. And the last y value we come across is this arrow so that would indicate infinity. So for the range here, when we scan from bottom to top, would be positive 2 to infinity. And since there's an ordered pair there, like it's not a whole or an asymptote, then it's a closed bracket from 2 to infinity. So for range as well, we use interval notation. And since we want to scan from the negative end to the positive end, we're going to scan the graph from the bottom to the top. That sounds like a song. Now, when we talk about the value of a function, this is really important. The value of a function means the function's y value at any point. So if I ask you what is the value of the function, I'm asking you for a y value. So each ordered pair on this graph has um, an ordered, like has a two coordinates, an x and a y. So everywhere on here, we can think of like x comma y or x comma g of x because um, function notation means the same thing as y, like g of x means y. So every ordered pair has that 
format. So let's look at being able to ask some questions about this graph besides domain and range. So we want to find the value of g of x. So remember, value means y value when x equals negative 2. So this is meaning g of negative 2. So I'm looking for the ordered pair that has negative 2, comma, something. This something right there is g of negative 2, and it's the y value when x is negative 2. So if x is negative 2, I go up to this ordered pair here, and it is negative 2, 4. Negative 2, 4. So the value of g of negative 2 would be 4. What is the value of g of x when x equals 5? So we've got the same thing going on here. When x equals 5, so 5 comma g of 5, that's what we're looking for, g of 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So here's x equals 5. And this ordered pair here would be 5, 2. So the value of g of x when x equals 5 is 2. Let's reverse that a little bit. And now let's find x values if we are given a y value. So we have had two sort of sets of instructions. One, find the y value if we're given the x value. The other, find the x value if we're given a y value. So now we are asked to find what values of x would g of x or the y value equal 4. So I'm looking for ordered pairs that go some number comma 4. So here's a y value. So let's find where y is 4 on our graph. 1, 2, 3, 4. Here's y equals 4. So I need every place on this graph that has a y value of 4. So I found one right here because I already had it labeled. So when uh, x is negative 2, y is 4. So x equals negative 2 is one of those. I keep going across. Here's another one. This ordered pair is 3, 4. So when x is 3, y is also 4. And then I have another one over here. Now, don't be thrown off just because there's not like a big dot there. Small dots also have ordered pairs. They're just not like emphasized like that. So this ordered pair would be 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 4. So also when x equals 8. Um, how about for what values of x is g of x equals 0? So this is meaning that the y value equals 0. In other words, I'm looking for ordered pairs in the format number, comma, 0. So these are, remember, our x-intercepts. So y equals 0 is going to be the x-axis here. And looking on here, there are no places that this graph has a y value of 0. So there are none. There are no x values that makes that happen. Which is larger, g of 8 or g of 4? So let's look on our graph at g of 8 and g of 4. So g of 8 here was 4. And g of 4 is like 3. Um, I don't necessarily have to know those values, but I can tell that g of 8 is higher up on the graph, like higher on the y axis. So g of 8 would be bigger than g of 4. So g of 8 is larger. Why? Because g of 8 is higher on the graph than g of 4. Here's that same graph again. I'm still wanting to do some comparing on that. For what values of x is g of x less than some number? It doesn't have to be 4. It is in this case. Or greater than some number. Oftentimes, they'll ask you greater than 0, less than 0. 
but this time we're going to look at 4 to start with and then compare that to what if it was great, less than or equal to. So greater than and less than and less than or equal to. Let's talk about what that means. So I first need to identify where on my graph um, g of x equals 4. Remember g of x is a y value and this is the y value of 4. So we're looking for the y value of 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. That's right here. And if I kind of draw that value of y equals 4 across my entire graph here, then when it asks me for what values of x is g of x less than 4, less than 4 means any part of the graph that's down below that line y equals 4. So if I imagine just covering up this part of my graph that's above it, being less than 4 means that the graph is below that line y equals 4. So not on it, but below it. So then we're talking about open circles because it's on the line right here, but it's below the line between here and here. See, those x values were 3, 4, 5, 6, 3, and 8. So everywhere between 3 and 8, that graph is below y equals 4. So that's going to be an open interval between 3 and 8. Now what about when it's greater than 4? That means the graph is above y equals 4. So then I want to switch my thinking around and look at where is my graph above y equals 4. So that is going to happen between whatever x value this is and whatever x value this is, then I skip a space, and then it's from this x value forever. So it's going to go from here to here, and then again, open circle on to infinity. So where is that on my number line? It looks like from negative 2 right here, negative 2 to 3, and then 8 to infinity. Remember that when we have a gap in our interval notation, we use that u for union. So negative 2 to 3, union 8 to infinity. What if I changed it to be less than or equal to? So that would mean the graph is on or below y equals 4. So that's going to change on or below y equals 4. That's above. Let's look at below. On or below would be from closed circle here because it's on over to closed circle here. So that makes it from 3 to 8 with closed circles. Okay, what do we got next? Where is g of x greater than 3? Okay, so now we're going to still apply those same ideas, except now we want our line to be y equals 3. So this means above the line y equals 3. So y equals 3 would be right here. We're wanting above, so we want everything above y equals 3. So it is above, starting at this x value. There's nothing to the left of it, so we got to start from there and over to here. And it's not including this x value because it's only above. And then we got a gap. Then we start again, and we're still above 
for the rest of the time. So if we pull that down, oops, that goes from negative two, it looks like, to four, and then from seven to infinity. So we had a closed circuit, circuit closed circle at negative two, and then an open circle at four. Then we had a gap, and we started back up at seven and went to infinity. Where is g of x greater than zero? Where is g of x less than zero? So greater than zero means above y equals zero, which is the x-axis. Less than zero means below y equals zero, so the y-axis. So if we look at the line y equals zero, that's this guy, the x-axis here. Where is this graph above that line y equals zero? Well, like everywhere the graph exists, right? So starting here at this x value, what was negative two, and then all the way to infinity. So the graph is above y equals zero from negative two to infinity. And then where is this graph below y equals zero? Well, there's no graph that's below it, so that would be nowhere. Alrighty. <coughs> now we just have a whole bunch of examples to look at. So on 13 through 20, 14 through 21 is all we have on here. We have just some of them. Determine whether the graph is a function using the vertical line test. If it is, use the graph to find domain and range, intercepts, and symmetry. So let's look to see if things are functions. So 14, if I use vertical line test, 14 is yes, it's a function. 16, yes, it's a function. 17 is no, because I've got uh, failing the vertical line test. 18 is also no, circles are not functions. And 21 is yes. So then we've got to go back and do domain and range on the ones that are functions. So domain, remember we were going to scan the graph from left to right using those x values as our domain. So as I scan 14 left to right, the first thing I run into on that graph is an arrow, which means negative infinity, and the last thing is another arrow. So the domain here will be negative infinity to infinity, 16, domain. The first x value I run across is negative pi. I have solid y value, x values until I get to pi. So this domain would be negative pi to pi. And since I have closed circles on both ends, they have brackets. Uh, 21. Going left to right, the first thing I run into is that arrow all the way to the other end. I have another arrow, so its domain is negative infinity to infinity as well. Range. Range, we want to scan bottom to top, or you can turn your graph this direction and scan it left to right. So we're looking at the y values. It looks like this graph just kind of continues and doesn't touch or cross this line y equals zero. We see that um, a lot. This is an exponential function, and those do that every time. So we're going to start this one at zero, but it's not going to touch zero. And then as I scan up, the last thing I run into is that arrow. So we have zero to infinity. 16, this guy looks like a sine function, or at least part of a sine function. As I scan bottom to top, the first y value that bumps this graph is negative 1, and the last y value is 1. Based on what I know about that trig function, those do include the values negative 1 and 1. 
And then this weird looking graph, bottom to top, the first thing I encounter is that arrow on both ends, which means the range keeps going forever. So negative infinity up to this last y value of two. So the range here will go from negative infinity up to two with a bracket since I do have those y values included. So there was domain and range. Next, intercepts. So intercepts could include x-intercepts and y-intercepts. So I want to look both places. So in 14, there are no x-intercepts. There is a y-intercept at 0, 1. 16, I have 1, 2, 3 intercepts. So negative pi 0 is an x-intercept. 0, 0 is an x-intercept and a y-intercept. And then pi 0 is an x-intercept. 21, looks like we've got one here. So negative 3, 0. There's one here, 0, 2. And then over there, 3, 0. And then symmetry. So remember, symmetry, we're looking to see, um, can I fold the graph in half, like over either the x-axis or the y-axis, or does it have origin symmetry? Now they're kind of pulling a tricky question here because if a graph has um, y-axis symmetry, then that means it's not going to be a function. So if we look at our graphs that are not functions, these two have Oh, sorry, I meant x-axis symmetry. I underscored the wrong thing. The x-axis symmetry is not a function. If I can fold it over the x-axis, it has x-axis symmetry. So this one does, but it's not a function. Same thing here. This one actually has x-axis symmetry, y-axis symmetry, and origin symmetry. So this has all three symmetries. But they didn't ask us really to do that. Um, but that was just a bonus. So y-axis and origin is what we're looking for. The y-axis, can I fold it across the y-axis? The answer to that is no. Can I fold this across the y-axis? No. Uh, 21, can I fold this across the y-axis? Yes. So this guy has y-axis symmetry. And then origin symmetry is if I can rotate my graph, like hold the origin still and rotate it, 180 degrees and have it look the same. So this guy, if I rotate it 180 degrees, does not look the same. This one, if I rotate it 180 degrees, it looks identical, just upside down. So this one has origin symmetry. And then this one, if I rotate it, it's not going to look the same because it's going to be down below the axis. So that is all for symmetries. Okay, let's answer some questions on 12 and 31. Okay, f of 0 and f of 6. Remember, f of 0 means find the y value when x is 0. f of 6 means find the y value when f is 6. So f of 0 is labeled on here, 0, 0, so f of 0 equals 0, and f of 6 would be the y value when x is 6, which is also 0. Now that means that those are x-intercepts, so if we can find anywhere in here, aha, x-intercepts right here. I have an x-intercept at 0, 0, we just saw that, and another x-intercept at 6, 0, but looking along here, I do have a third one at 4, 0. F of 2 and F of negative 2. So that means when X is 2, what is the Y value? So when X is 2, the Y value is negative 2. So F of 2 equals negative 2. F of negative 2, the Y value is 1. So F of negative 2 equals 1. Is f of 3 positive or negative? So being positive means 
that the graph is going to be above the y, the x-axis. Being negative means the graph is going to be below the x-axis. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. f of x is positive means the graph is above the x-axis. f of x is negative means the graph is below the x-axis. So looking at f of 3, f of 3 right here, f of 3 means the y value when x is 3, and I don't know what it is necessarily, but I see that it's down here. So it is negative because it's below the x-axis, and f of negative 1 right here, that is above, so it is positive. Now what does it mean if f of x is 0. Well, we've already looked at that. f of x equals 0 at f of 0, f of 6, and f of 4. So when f of x equals 0, that means the graph is on the x-axis. So where did f of x equal 0? Well, that equaled 0 at the x values of 0, 4, and 6. For what values of x is f of x less than 0? So less than 0 is the same thing as negative. So I guess I could write that in there. f of x is negative. Could also say f of x is less than 0. Positive could say f of x is greater than 0. And is 0 would be f of x equals 0. So for what values of x is f of x less than 0? Again, that would mean below the x-axis. So I would want to look at this interval. It's not including the places it touches. So everywhere between this pair, this point, and this point is below. So that would go from 0 to 4 not including, so 0 to 4. Domain. Domain is all the x values as we scan left to right across the graph. So scanning left to right. I don't have arrows on the ends, so that means the graph just flat out stops. So all the x values between negative 4 all the way over to 6 has a graph. So that would be negative 4 to 6, and then range, we're going to scan the graph from bottom to top. So bottom to top, what's the lowest y value? Negative 2. What's the highest y value? 3. So the range would be negative 2 to 3, both with brackets. Y-intercept, there's only one y-intercept on a function. And that's where your graph is going to cross the y-axis. And we want to give that as an ordered pair. So that would be right here at 0, 0. So on this graph, it's at 0, 0. But on other graphs, it could be other values. How often does the line y equals negative 1 intersect the graph? So I want to kind of look at where is y equals negative 1. That's going to be here. So if I look at the graph of y equals negative 1, it's going to cross the graph two times. What about x equals 1? x equals 1 is a vertical line, and it better only cross it one time because this is a function, and it does only one time.
for what value of x does f of x equal 3? So now we need to find an ordered pair that goes what number, comma, 3. So we find the y value of 3. And we look across, and I see that that only happens one place. It's at 5, 3, so that would be x equals 5. For what value of x does f of x equals negative 2? So I'm looking for x value comma negative 2. And on this graph, that only happens one time as well. And that happens at x equals 2. Now if they had asked me something else like uh, when does f of x equal 1, I would have had to have 1, 2, 3 of those answers. So just be careful that you don't just get one answer and then call it good. Okay, let's look at two functions on the same set of axes. I want to be able to add functions together, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, all the things. So our functions f of x, f of x is this line, and then g of x is the parabola. So they're going to ask us to do some stuff with f and g. Remember that um, f plus g of 2 means that we're going to take f of 2 and add g of 2. So f of 2 plus g of 2. Um, f of 2 means the y value when x is 2 on f of x. So that is going to be when x is 2, the y value on f of x is 2 as well. So that's going to be 2 plus g of 2, which is the y value when x is 2 on g of x. That's right here, which is 1. So f plus g of 2 would be 3. f minus g of 6 means we are going to be taking f of 6 and subtracting g of 6. So f of 6 was f of 6 is the line function when x is 6, 4, 5, 6, the value, the y value for f of x is 0. So we've got 0, and then we're going to subtract g of 6. g of 6 is here, is 1. So 0 minus 1, f minus g of 6 would be negative 1. f times g of 2. So in this case, we're taking f of 2, and we are going to multiply it by g of 2. We already know f of 2 and g of 2 from previous, so that's going to be 2 times 1. So f times g of 2 would just be 2. f plus g of 4, same thing, f of 4 plus g of 4. So f of 4, looking on here, f of 4 is 1. And then we're going to add g of 4. G of 4, looking at our graph, is negative 3. So when we add those together, we're going to get negative 2. G minus F of 6 is actually the reverse order from F minus G of 6. So on this one, we're doing G of 6 minus F of 6. And we just saw that that was uh, G of 6 was 1, F of 6 was 0. So this answer is 1. And then f over g of 4, so we want f of 4 divided by g of 4. f of 4 we already saw is 1. g of 4 is negative 3. So this answer would be negative 1 third. Okay. Let's see what we got on the next page. 
we need to decide if a point is on a graph. Without looking at the graph, they just want to know, is this ordered pair on the graph? So in order to answer that question, we are going to want to sub in the ordered pair. and see if it comes out to be true or false. So in A, that's what we're going to do. So we're gonna put in two for the Y value, F of X is Y, so two equals negative three times X squared, so negative three times negative one squared, plus five times X, which is negative one, Follow order of operations, square the negative one, that makes one, then do our multiplying. So two would equal negative three plus negative five. So two equals negative eight. That is false, so it is not. Negative one, two is not on the graph. of F. Letter B. If X equals negative 2, what point is on the graph of F? So when they're asking you to do that, they are just asking you to find F of negative 2. So that's a pretty easy task. So for letter B, F of negative 2, we're going to replace X with negative 2. So we got negative 3 times negative 2 squared plus 5 times negative 2. Order of operations, we'll square first. So negative 3 times 4 plus 5 times negative 2, then multiply. Negative 12 plus negative 10. So we get negative 22. So they're asking what point is on the graph. Well, the x value was negative 2 and the y value was negative 22. So that is our ordered pair. What are they asking me to do here? If f of x is a number, what is x? So that means we're going to set f of x like equal to that number and solve for x. So part C, replace f of x with negative 2, so that's this part. Negative 2 equals negative 3x squared plus 5x. And then we're solving that. So bring all my terms to the same side. And then I could either factor, quadratic formula, complete the square, because that's a quadratic equation. So let's factor it. Okay, if we use AC method, we're looking for two things that multiply to negative 6x squared, but add to negative 5x. So that will be 3x squared, and then it'll be negative 6x times positive x. So minus 6x plus 5x minus 2, oh, plus x. I don't know why I made that 5 equals 0. So then that'll be 3x times x minus 2 plus 1 times x minus 2. So then one of my parentheses is x minus 2. The other is 3x plus 1. Then, of course, I set each of these parentheses equal to 0. So 3x plus 1 equals 0, or x minus 2 equals 0, which gives me x equals 2 from here, minus 1 minus 1, 3x equals negative 1, divide by 3, so x equals negative 1 third. So what ordered pairs would be on the graph? Well, the x values are 2 and negative 1 third, and we got those by using a y value of negative 2. So 2, negative 2, and negative one-third, negative two. 
E. Oh, sorry, D. What is the domain? Domain. So domain, remember we're looking for, um, to see if we have any variables under an even index radical or variables in the denominator. We don't have either of those things, so the domain would be all real numbers. F, list the x-intercepts. So to find x-intercepts, x-intercepts, the y value is zero. So to find x-intercepts, we're going to set f of x equal to zero and solve for x. So I need to replace f of x with zero, letter E, and then solve that equation. So I'm gonna need to factor that uh, which I have a GCF of x, so 0 would equal x times negative 3x plus 5. Set each of those equal to 0, so x equals 0, or negative 3x plus 5 equals 0, which would be 3x equals 5. Divide both sides by 3. x equals 5 thirds. So my x-intercepts as ordered pairs would be 0, 0 from that one. So 0, 0 and 5 thirds, 0. F, y-intercept. For a y-intercept, we're going to sub in 0 for x. So subbing in 0 for x. That means we're finding f of 0. So replace our x's with the input of 0. So negative 3 times 0 squared plus 5 times 0, which gives me 0. So my y-intercept is 0, 0. OK, second to last problem. Match each of the following functions to the graph that best describes the situation. So the temperature of a bowl of soup as a function of time. So a bowl of soup, if you start with a hot bowl of soup and over time it cools down, so it's going to start hot and then it's going to cool over time. Let's see, that looks like it could only be this guy right here, which is letter two. So if we have time here, and then the temperature of soup on the y-axis, the temperature of the soup over time cools off. Number of daylight hours per day over a two-year period. Well, we're getting ready right now for daylight savings time to end in like a couple of weeks. And I can tell you that the days are getting shorter. And then remember that in the summer, the days seem longer because we have more sunlight. So the number of hours of daylight per day over a two-year period would fluctuate from a lot of sunlight to a little sunlight, to a lot of sunlight, to a little sunlight. So that's going to be this guy right here. So letter five, if we have um, hours of sunlight on the y-axis, and then days on the x-axis. So then here we'd have like the winter solstice or whatever, the shortest days of the year. Here we'd have the longest days of the year. So over a period of two years, we'd have shortest and longest hours of sunlight. Population of Florida, I have no idea. We'll go back to that one. Distance traveled by a car going at a constant velocity. So when we start off, our car is going to not have traveled very much distance. Constant velocity means a constant rate of change. Velocity is rate of change. So if you look at all of these graphs, there's only one that has a constant rate of change, which we sometimes also call slope. And that is going to be graph number three. Because we have time on the x-axis and distance on the y-axis. So as we travel at a constant rate of speed, our distance consistently increases. 
the height of a golf ball hit with a seven iron. I don't even know what a seven iron is, but we'll just go with it as a function of time. So this one actually looks by like a golf ball. So here we have time and here we have the height of the golf ball. So when we hit it, it goes up in the air and then it comes back down. So that will be graph number one, which leaves us with only one choice for Florida. And that is graph number four. So apparently the population of Florida is increasing right now. <coughs> so if we have time on the X axis, we have population of Florida. On the Y axis, and apparently that's increasing. All right, Michael. Michael is going to be driving his car. So we have time on the x-axis, velocity on the y-axis. So that's his speed, not his distance. So when they ask us over what time interval is Michael traveling the fastest, um, we want to look at where is his velocity the highest on the graph. So that is going to be up here where he's going 50 whatever miles per hour, 50 miles per hour. Um, so in between the times of 7 and 7.4. So we could say from 7 to 7.4 in interval notation, or we could say time is between 7 minutes and 7.4 minutes. So that's up here where he's traveling the fastest. Over what interval or intervals was his speed zero. His speed being zero would be all the way down here on zero for speed. And so that is going to be happening on this time interval right here between 4.2 and 6 seconds or between 4.2 and 6 seconds in inequality notation. What was his speed between zero and two minutes? Well, zero to two minutes goes from here to here, and his speed actually is not the same. His speed goes anywhere between zero miles per hour and 30, you can't see that, zero miles per hour and 30 miles per hour in that two minute time range. So his velocity is as small as zero and as big as 30 between that time interval. What about between 4.2 and 6 minutes? Well, we just looked at between 4.2 and 6 minutes right here, and his velocity is 0. What about his speed between 7 and 7.4 minutes? So we've already also looked at that one. Between 7 and 7.4 minutes, his velocity is constant at 50 miles per hour. Then when is his speed constant? So that means his speed is not slowing up or slowing or slowing down or speeding up. So that's going to be constant between here and here, between here and here, here and here, and here and here. So his time is going to be between 2 and 4, and then again 4.2 to 6, and then again from 7 to 7.4. And then finally, between 7.6 and 8.